On-the-scene coverage of ACC14 is supported by Janssen Pharmaceuticals, Incorporated. I'm Peter Block from On the Scene here at the ACC annual meeting in Washington, D.C., and this is a day two wrap-up. With me is Deepak Bhatt from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He needs no introduction. So, Deepak, uh, another exciting day of late-breaking clinical trials. We've got the CHOICE trial to talk about, perhaps the, the second blockbuster in this group of trials that we've covered. Uh, we also have colchicine for pericarditis, interesting, and then I think we should lip, pay lip service to PCSK9 one more time. So sure. let's talk about CHOICE. Well, I think it's a terrific trial, and I think it's a terrific meeting for TAVR in general, because of course yesterday we had some great data about the core valve trial showing clearly that it was not inferior to surgery and even a reduction in mortality. So to me, that was a home run. And now a second trial relating to TAVR, this time head-to-head, -head, comparing the Edwards device with the core valve. And first of all, I guess I would say, I thought both devices performed really well. So to me, that might be the overarching sort of message uh, beyond just, you know, is this one a little bit better this way? Is this other one a little bit better that way? But, you know, what do you think? Well, I think, the good news about this is it gives us options, and that's terrific. Core valve data are very striking. Uh, we'll see whether or not that holds up longer term and what really the mechanism is of all of this, but the bottom line is it gives us as interventional cardiologists lots of ideas about which patients to use which device for. That's a good thing. Uh, the choice trial people will criticize because it's a relatively small trial, it wasn't, you know, there wasn't a central place where they randomized patients, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is, they had uh, 240 patients in this trial, randomized one-to-one, -one, interesting outcomes. They're going to do some long-term follow-up. That's right. going to be very important. And if at one year there is this continued difference, which is exactly sort of the opposite of what the core valve data showed, then we're just going to have to say, isn't that interesting? Because I think comparing all of these trials to each other is foolishness. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. I, I think in some respects it ends up being sort of like the stent wars. You know, this stent's better than that stent. Sure, I don't mean to say there aren't subtle differences, sometimes clinically important differences, but right now I think we're at a stage in TAVR where we can say we've got two really good devices. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So that's all good news. So let's move on to colchicine and pericarditis. Now, for me, I, I thought that was a dynamite trial. Now, we've used colchicine for a while, but this really showed once and for all that for recurrent pericarditis, the use of colchicine with an anti-inflammatory, not necessarily steroids. As a matter of fact, very few of the patients needed steroids, but the colchicine reduced recurrent event rates by half, and that's a big change. Oh, I agree with you, and this is now building upon a series of trials that have been wins for colchicine and pericarditis, acute chronic recurrence. So uh, right now, I think it's moved up. And, and as you said, I've been using it for a while in pericarditis as well. But I think it moves up to maybe first-line therapy. I would think so. So colchicine for sure for recurrent pericarditis. And candidly, if I had pericarditis tomorrow, I'd probably take colchicine. I think so too. <laughs> yeah, with an anti-inflammatory. Right. Probably aspirin. Okay. So one more time, uh, let's talk about PCSK9 antibodies. Uh, it, today, we heard about what I think is the most important group, the statin intolerant group and how they fare. Absolutely, so in real life clinicians see these patients. We've all got these patients that are statin intolerant. Of course, one can argue just how high the prevalence of that is because some of it, you know, if you re-challenge them and so forth, they're not truly statin intolerant. But for sure, there's at least some percentage of patients that are statin intolerant. And for those patients, I think this is a really useful advance. Well, the good news about this trial as well was that for the statin intolerant patients who had myopathy, quote unquote, uh, the reduction in the number of patients that's continued to have some muscle pains was down to 6%. So that's a big change. And the also good news in this trial was that these are essentially untreated patients because they can't take statins. And they started out with LDLs in the 190 range. They got to goal. They got to less than 100 with this PCSK9 antibody. 
That's good news, and I think this is going to be a blockbuster drug. I, I think so, and it's in a larger context as well where these drugs are also being studied in different populations to see if they affect actual cardiovascular outcomes. So the whole package is building, but so far so good. Thanks, Deepak. And so there's a wrap-up for day two. Lots of interesting stuff. There'll be more tomorrow and day three. But so far, we've had nothing but great clinical trials. Thank you.